of all the amazing things about the universe, I think two stand above all the rest. One of them is that we know so much about the universe, but another is that there's even more that we don't know. And what I want to focus on for this lecture is the inexplicable universe from a time gone by that is now explained. Human cultures have for a long time harbored scientific mysteries. In fact, in the pre-scientific era, that would be before Galileo, 400 years ago, before then, many of the nature's most unknown mysteries were thought to be the work of divinity. Take, for example, epilepsy. There's someone writhing on the ground, your best friend, frothing at the mouth. If, you have, if you're driven by Christian theology, your first thought is, the person is possessed by the devil. That's the natural explanation for what's going on there, in the absence of any other knowledge about neurosynaptic processes. In another example, you could go out to the woods one morning, one damp, cool morning, and you'll find this circle of mushrooms. No one knew how they got there. You were there the day before, there was no trace of mushrooms. And now, there's a perfect circle of them. These were known as fairy circles. And people imagined sort of woodland, woodland nymphs, woodland fairies coming to have a jamboree. And these were their chairs, little fairies, of course. These were their chairs where they celebrated whatever were their rituals of the night. We would later learn that, of course, mushrooms are, are they're not solo organic entities. They're, in fact, they're, they're, one spore can generate many, many mushrooms. And if a spore drops in one spot, it can work its way out and get ready for just when the conditions are right, just the right temperature, just the right humidity. And then they all pop up equidistant from where that spore first dropped. So explanations came later to these phenomena. And of course, we know epilepsy is the result of random firing of the brain, uncontrolled firing, that, is, that leaves you helpless in the presence of a brain gone awry. So what we found is that things started to change in the rise of the experiment. If you go back in time to Aristotle's day, people imagined that you could just sit in a chair and just think about the universe. You didn't have to go out and test it. You just thought it up. Aristotle imagined that heavy things fell faster than light things. Of course, yes, a rock falls faster than a feather. The feather feels the air resistance on its way down. But take a heavy rock and a light rock, they'll actually fall together at the same rate. Aristotle, however, said that the heavy one will fall faster than the light one in direct proportion to its weight. This is patently false. And it would take Galileo 1,500 years later to demonstrate that this was the case. He describes the experiment of dropping two balls from the side of the leaning tower of Pisa. And they're both falling at exactly the same rate, hitting the ground at the same time. Of course, that would happen with a rock and a feather. You just have to evacuate the air from where you're doing the experiment. And in fact, that was indeed done, that very experiment on the surface of the moon. So what I want to do for this lecture is focus on several stunning examples of profound mysteries that plagued the deepest thinkers of their day, but ultimately got explained.
into Ballistic Trajectory Lesson 1. Here we are on our virtual pier and lined up on this pier are some cannons which you will get to use later on. In this lesson we learn a simple equation that will allow you to accurately hit a target thousands of metres away. In this case we have a ship that is ready to be scuttled and you need to sink it by hitting it with a cannonball. This particular calculation is a simplified version that doesn't take into account wind conditions or temperature. So for this simplified lesson we will be shooting in a vacuum so there is no drag on your cannonball making things a little bit easier. So first a couple of concepts you should know before we begin. Firstly all objects will fall towards the ground at the same rate no matter how heavy or how large they are. This might seem counterintuitive as if I asked you to drop a rock and a feather from the top of a tall building you would expect the rock to hit the ground first and of course you would be right. However it would have nothing to do with how heavy it is. The feather is slowed down by wind resistance on its way down where the rock has less surface area compared to its mass and will fall more rapidly. This was proved way back in the 17th century by Galileo who held an experiment that showed two similar shaped objects would fall at the same speed despite being different weights. If we wanted to see this happen with a rock and a feather we would have to create a vacuum and evacuate all of the air from around us to see both objects falling at the same rate and hitting the ground at the same time. This very experiment was indeed done on the moon by Apollo astronauts back in the 70s. Secondly, horizontal speed parallel to the ground has nothing whatsoever to do with vertical drop. The reason I'm stating this is simple. If we fire a cannonball from our cannon horizontal to the ground and at the same time simply drop a second cannonball exactly the same height as the ball fired from the cannon, both of the cannonballs will hit the ground at exactly the same time. The cannonball we dropped will be on the ground just in front of us, but the cannonball we fired from the cannon will be hundreds or thousands of metres away from us, depending on how fast its muzzle velocity was when it left the cannon. So to reiterate, an object's horizontal speed has nothing whatsoever to do with Earth's gravitational pull. So why are these two points important? Well, it's simple. If we shoot a cannonball from our cannon, and it takes three tenths of a second to hit its target, it will also fall towards the ground for three tenths of a second. We have to ensure that our cannonball trajectory is at a height 